uh, about um, a month after my 23rd birthday, I ended up in treatment. I should go back for a second. And um, which I thought was going to be a spa at the time. It was in the 80s, and I didn't know um, much about it. My life was in shambles, but I somehow thought, I don't know, a spa might help. Uh, it wasn't a spa, and um, I learned there about the disease model of addiction. And despite the fact that I had been kicked out of three schools and homeless and evicted from many places, and um, including some not very nice bars, I, uh, I thought, oh, diseases can be cured. I'll, I'll fix this. How hard can it be? And um, be, able to, be able to use, really, is what I was thinking. So it's really a testament to um, how determined uh, an addict can be to pursue her goal. And um, I, I can't even, I, I don't know how, but uh, I managed to finish school, which wasn't quite so hard. It took me seven years to get my undergraduate because I was wasted for so much of it. But um, I, I uh, eventually did succeed. And it wasn't so bad once you show up sober. I found it wasn't that complicated uh, as I thought. Um, and then somehow got into graduate school and spent seven years getting a PhD in neuroscience. And then I did a postdoctoral fellowship for three years. And um, somewhere along the way, uh, not, not really, you know, a few years in, I guess, it was dawning on me that things were not going to be that simple, that addiction is such a complex, uh, multifarious disease or state disorder that. Um, I'd be lucky to understand any little piece of it. So um, I've spent 30 years pursuing uh, basically pharmacology and genetics in animal models, and uh, you know, kind of entertaining myself and a few of the people who read my papers. Um, but about 10 years ago, it dawned on me that um, maybe I could do something more useful by helping to translate what scientists neuroscientists understand about the brain um, and how it's different for those of us that become addicts before we start using and certainly during uh, the development of an addiction and even after an addiction. So that's the purpose of the book and I'm just going to give you kind of the core uh, things about that today. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions later, but if there's something I say that's unclear that's bothering you right at the time, please interrupt me then. Otherwise, I'll, I'll take as many questions as we have time for. So, of course, um, everybody knows that addiction is characterized by an overwhelming compulsion to use. And um, this kind of supersedes all other motivations. And that was the case for me. Um, there's tolerance, so a tendency to increase the dose, and dependence, generally physical, but also psychic. I, I hit bottom so quickly, mostly because of cocaine, although I used everything I could get my little hands on for about 10 years. But I think cocaine is why I got so um, damaged so fast. Um, and in the early 80s, we didn't even think cocaine was an addictive drug because it didn't cause physical dependence like opiates or alcohol. So now we recognize it could be physical dependence, but also could be a sort of a psychological dependence, which means you feel absolutely miserable without it. Um, there has to be a detrimental effect on the individual and on society, and I'm really glad for this because I uh, have a definite caffeine habit, and since it's not bad for you, I don't worry about that addiction at all, but um, the final criteria, I guess, or hallmark of addiction is a denial about the problem, which is part of the reason it's so um, insidious and resistant to treatment. But I want to begin, uh, not with, I want to be, have my second beginning, I guess, with someone else's story. And this is um, from Socrates' last day. So he was imprisoned and sentenced to death for um, corrupting the youth, funny enough, and um, failing to endorse this, the state gods. And um, as he, the um, jailer took his, um, sorry, as the jailer took his uh, 
um, what are they called? Shackles off, yeah, gosh, that was weird. Um, he, he said uh, this, among other things. He was talking, he spoke a lot, and uh, Plato recorded much of what he said, but he said this interesting thing about his experience taking the shackles off. He said that um, pleasure and pain are curiously related. You might think they're the opposite, but if you have one, you always have the other. And that turns out to really... Uh, foretell, I think, our understanding of the neurobiology of addiction. So I'm going to jump ahead about 2,000 years, uh, mid-19th century, um, to a French physiologist who you may have remember from biology class or something, Claude Bernard, who um, studied human physi or actually animal physiology to understand human physiology. And he recognized um, this tendency toward a stable internal state, a milieu interior, that was, um, he said, a condition for a free and independent life, which is funny because he was mostly studying things like heart rate and blood pressure. But um, he, uh, this idea about the, um, an equilibrium, an internal equilibrium necessary for a stable, uh, a free and independent life, um, was something that was picked up many years later, about 80 years later, by a, an American physiologist at Harvard called Walter Cannon. And he took this uh, stable equilibrium state and he um, gave it a name, which is homeostasis. And this is, um, the tendency, again, toward equilibrium, which is a way of maintaining stability through change. So um, he, by the way, was also the person who um, coined the term fight or flight along the same lines of homeostasis. So our um, autonomic nervous system can mediate arousal um, in a way that enables us to fight or flee, but also then uh, it can, our autonomic nervous system has the um, compensatory or counter response of mediating um, calm and the parasympathetic nervous system gets active. So um, this idea of homeostasis is really at the heart of the book. And um, I think we all can probably appreciate this in our own lives. If um, I, I, I talk to students a lot, and um, we've all experienced the kind of um, yin and yang, I guess, of this internal stable state. If you're stressed out taking an exam, for instance, when that exam is over, um, I bet many of us can remember not just going about our day as normal, but um, maybe doing something like this, or eating a big meal and then doing something like this. So the sympathetic arousal that happens during the test time is um, uh, causes the parasympathetic counter response. So we have both of these sides. And I have kind of a funny story about this. Um, I was one time, I was in graduate school, and I was out at um, Mesa Verde National Park, which is out in the southwest in the Four Corners region. It's an amazing place where the uh, Native Americans built kind of condominiums in the rock walls. If you haven't been there, it would be good to go. Um, but I was driving early one morning. It was maybe 6 in the morning, and I uh, was following an RV that ran over a squirrel. And, but this, you know, the RV is pretty tall, so the squirrel was just standing in the middle of the road. So I'm, I pull up in my little Ford Escort or whatever it was, and the, and the squirrel is just standing in the road like this. And so there was not traffic behind me, so I didn't move, but I eventually pulled over. And I walk up to the squirrel, and I'm getting, I get really close to him. It's been a, probably now, you know, two minutes or 90 seconds. And I get pretty close to the squirrel, and all of a sudden it just keels over dead. I know. It was really sad. And it wasn't, it didn't get hit. Um, but I was in grad school at the time, so I thought, what in the world is this? Well, it's called parasympathetic overshoot. And this is kind of how you die of fright. So you don't die often from the sympathetic, the fight or flight response. You die from the compensatory, homeostatic response to bring you back to normal. And the little thing shut down its heart. You know, it was so excited that 
um, couldn't quite bear it. So that happened to the squirrel, but um, maybe this is uh, kind of a message for addiction that we could talk about a little at a time, but um, I don't know if anybody in here has done parachuting. I have not. But it doesn't look like a lot of fun to <laughs> jump out of the plane, and uh, you probably feel like you're going to die, like maybe the squirrel felt. Um, but people who do it regularly, and it is maybe an addictive behavior a little bit in some ways, what they report is that the response after they land and they live is so wonderful. It's, a, it's the exact opposite feeling of the feeling of panic and fear and I'm going to die. It's a feeling of um, calm and peacefulness and uh, easy day. So it produces, I guess, quite a euphoria after you hit the ground. And that kind of leads to um, a new development in the idea of homeostasis that um, was first proposed by two um, psychologists at the University of Pennsylvania, um, Richard Solomon and John Corbett, who was a student. They took this idea of homeostasis that was Cannon's and Bernard's and maybe even Socrates's, and um, they mixed it with an idea of color vision you may know about called the opponent process theory, um, to, which is basically that, again, you have this counter, you have this opposite kind of response. Um, so they applied it to emotional or feeling or affective states. And this um, uh, means that if you feel really fearful or afraid, like you would in jumping out of the airplane. It's not just your, your um, blood pressure that changes, it's your feeling state. Afterward, you feel really calm and relaxed. You don't go from being really afraid to just back to your normal state, in other words. You go from one extreme kind of to the opposite extreme. If you feel really happy, there's some great news or something wonderful happens, um, the response after that happy state is sadness. And we all kind of experience these things. Um, maybe not, we don't recognize them, but they propose that any stimulus that alters your brain functioning to change the way that you feel is going to elicit the opposite response by the brain in order to return you to homeostasis. So it's not just things like body temperature and heart rate and sympathetic arousal that the physiologists were describing. It's also the way we feel. So it happens all the time like this. I don't, um, they give many examples in their seminal paper, but let's say you uh, find a lump in your breast or somewhere and you think it might be cancerous. That would obviously induce feelings of worry and anxiety. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. <clears throat> and um, concern. If then you find out that that, um, that lump is benign, you wouldn't just go back to life as usual. Sorry, but you would probably feel greatly relieved and happy and thrilled for some time. <clears throat> when you go, it could be the opposite. You go on a vacation, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. How many people, when they come home from vacation, feel a little let down? Oh, this again. So you might have been in a good state before. You go and have this great time away, and then you come back, and it's a little less than wonderful. When the classic example is falling in love and having a crush. So this really initial period of falling in love is a very reliable way to change your feeling state. And you adapt, so you eventually kind of get used to that and everything is fine. And if that goes away, so someone dies or something, then there's really incredible grief. So um, as Socrates noted, um, one extreme feeling brings on the other. And the timing of those things depend on the stimulus. It turns out that this pattern really reflects the effects of any psychoactive drug. So a psychoactive drug is drug that changes the way we think or feel or behave. And if we look at your feeling state on um, this axis, and we all have a baseline feeling. It's not the same for each of us, 
but it is really stable. Unless you have a stroke or use a lot of stimulants um, addictively, then probably that is going to stay the same throughout your life. You just feel neutral. You feel like yourself. And what you do in response to uh, events in your environment is either um, notice that, that some change makes things good or some change makes things bad. So any change, it, this, this, I purposely didn't say um, good or bad up here. It could be either way. Um, but for drugs, obviously, it's going to be good. You get a, a, a rush for a drug, and you feel great for a minute or so or longer. And then it adapts and sort of is stable. But you always have this um, baseline at the end, this uh, below your neutral state. So this could be a hangover. It could be um, craving for another cigarette. It could be the dysphoria that happens after a Coke binge. It could be the um, misery and craving after an opiate. But it's always the case that you have the opposite experience when you have a strong change in your feeling state. So that should remind us of the shackles that were um, removed. So when uh, Socrates had those, ta they were painful when they were taken off. They, uh, in that, removing that stimulus produced the opposite effect. So that's kind of the core of their theory. And um, I want to just, this is a, a graph from their original paper, which is in the 1970s. Um, and this is the feeling that we just talked about. So this is the pattern that we just discussed about every psychoactive drug or any strong um, stimulus that changes our feeling state. And the reason that that pattern occurs, whoops, I shouldn't have done that, is because of two processes, the A and the B process. So for drugs, the A process is a direct result of what the drug does to the brain. So this could be um, uh, opiates interacting with opioid receptors. It could be um, cocaine blocking reuptake of dopamine. Whatever it is, um, that is the response to the drug, the brain's response to the drug. And that combines with the brain's response to the response to the drug. So the brain is going to try to compensate for that, to maintain homeostasis, just like Bernard pointed out. So this is a compensatory response to the effect of the drug. And that could be that the receptors downregulate. It could be that you increase enzymes. But when you combine the response to the drug and the brain's response, you get that pattern at the top. And that's why you have the... Um, the dip at the end. One thing we know about the brain, we know a few things, but one that probably its core attribute, its most uh, maybe glorious attribute, is its ability to adapt and to learn. And so the drug does adapt and to learn. And for that reason, the B process, with repeated exposures to a drug, uh, changes. It comes on earlier, and it's bigger, and it lasts longer. It's also, the brain is so good at adapting that it anticipates a drug or a change. So it comes on as a result of cues in the environment that predict the drug. So for instance, I, I told you I have a good coffee habit. I, the cues for my coffee are waking up, uh, you know, morning time, the grinder going, the water dripping. And during that time, my brain is actually making me more lethargic. So it's, it's counteracting the effects of coffee so that before I get the coffee, I'm uh, a unable to really, you know, uh, talk to anybody in my family or, you know, complete a thought. But after I get the coffee, I feel just right. I don't feel like wild anymore because my brain has counteracted that coffee. So this, um, and, and it starts counteracting it as soon as I know I'm going to get it. So I don't wake up, actually, in the morning until I have the coffee. 
So why do we have this B process to maintain homeostasis? You can see how these two things combine together to kind of keep things level here. So the combined effect now after repeated exposures is a little bit of a high and a big low afterward. Why does the brain bother doing that? It's kind of a shame. Well, it, I'm going to, uh, it is a shame. It's the, it's the problem for all addicts, really. Um, and I'm going to try to explain this in a, in a simple way. So every experience that we have is coded in the brain by altering uh, the activity of the brain. And if our activity in our brain looks something like this, so it was kind of big up and down, lots of big waves, and then something happened, it would be kind of hard to detect it. Whereas if our activity in our brain was clamped, at sort of a, a stable baseline, then we would know, oh, chocolate cake, or oh, a potential mate, or oh, you know, some opportunity or some stimulus that's going to cause a problem. So I can, I can detect things in my environment much only, really, in contrast to a stable baseline. So I would not be able to know if things were good or bad if my brain activity, good and bad, were being jacked around. I had no baseline. Does that make sense? So the adaptive B process, the learning B process, I said earlier, was um, anticipatory. It could, it could predict when the drug was coming. And certainly, um, paraphernalia are good cues to help predict that. Um, I think that treatment centers in the 70s, this was actually before my time, often um, removed an addict from their uh, conditions in maybe a totally different kinds of places, um, were sometimes called therapeutic communities where you'd go take care of goats or something in central Pennsylvania, like where I live now. And, you know, so remove you from your playground and your playmates, take you out, work with the goats for a year, totally get rid of your withdrawal symptoms and feel um, ready to go, and then um, go back home. And often people, even a year or close to that sober or clean, would go back and relapse quickly. Partly because um, the context, the cues, their friends, um, maybe using buddies, those kinds of things that they bump into would we cause the brain to produce that B process because it predicts, it still predicts, just like um, Pavlov do Pavlov's dog will salivate to the bell, you know, 10 years after he's heard the bell. It's really deep learning, this B process, and it's classically conditioned to these um, environmental cues. It also could be the time of the day or the week. I remember one time I was. Um, I was, I guess I was like in seventh or eighth grade, and I, I wasn't, I didn't, my parents were kind of strict, so I didn't like hanging around my house very much, but I had a friend whose parents were much more friendly and laid back, and um, I thought they were great, they were just easygoing. Um, and so I was going home with my friend to her house, and her father picked us up from a practice or something, and we got stuck on the highway, there was a really bad accident. And so um, 5.15 came, and then 5.45, and then 6.30. It was taking a long time to get home. And I was scared because this friend's father, who was normally kind of a even-killed guy, was getting red in the face and really, really tense and um, uptight. I mean, I had never seen this side of him. But I think it was now that he had a couple of Manhattans every day around 5, 5.30. And as the time went by and he didn't get those Manhattans, and the time itself was bringing on the B process, just like the time brings on my, uh, my lethargy in the morning with caffeine. It could be emotional states. So frustration is a big one for us. So any time uh, I felt uncomfortable, any time I had a strong feeling, really, I would um, use. I smoked copious amounts of weed. I uh, drank all the time, every day. And I think that I just was not used to feeling much. And so pulling all those drugs out of my bloodstream, 
I had a lot of feelings, and those were definitely, um, as most people know, strong triggers for using money. Getting, getting paid or having a lot of cash is a huge trigger. And not just, it's not for purely, uh, well, I don't know why we would think this would be, but it, the reason is because wads of cash for, let's say, a, um, an addict, a coke or some addict, um, predict that the drug is coming. So it's, it elicits the B process to maintain homeostasis, and that looks like craving. It looks like the opposite affective state, right? Instead of feeling euphoric, you feel dysphoric. Instead of feeling good with the world, you feel miserable with the world. So it could be anything, weather, music. I was clean about um, eight years, actually, uh, maybe not quite eight, because I was still living in Colorado in grad school. But I was driving down the road one day, perfectly content. I don't know what it was. Uh, maybe something came on the radio. or But all of a sudden, I had this unbelievably strong desire to um, smoke pot. It's come to me many times since then. But it's usually associated with something like a particular kind of music or weather. But these cues are all around us. I mean, that can't be overstated for someone who's trying to get clean, uh, I think there are more cues than ever, especially in commercials and billboards. In um, the last two or three cars I've rented all smell like weed. And I, you know, it's so frustrating. It's, I, I've been clean about 30 some years, and I don't think I could have done it early on. I don't think I could have been, I, I had to not be around it for a while because, um, I, I really liked smoking, and um, I think that is a strong trigger, the smell of the drug. And in fact, uh, there's three reasons people relapse, if you get right down to it. I, I mean, at least that I think. Um, one is a taste of drug, and it doesn't have to be the same drug. It could be any drug, because as you know, all addictive drugs activate the same core neurocircuitry, this mesolimbic, uh, sometimes called reward or news pathway, this dopamine pathway. Um, anything that stimulates that pathway is, is a potential risk. So um, that's one reason. And the taste of the drug, of course, will bring on a B process. Because what's the best predictor of changing your feeling state with the drug? Oh, the drug. Um, stress is the other big one. I'm not sure exactly how that ties into the B process yet, but it's a strong feeling maybe, but stress is a, a common cause. And the third main cause is um, cues associated with the drug, which definitely being on the B process. So these, um, at least two of these, elicit a B process, which again is the opposite of the drug's main effects. And if you're striving to get the main effects of the drug, and you are feeling the opposite, then you know the solution to that is the drug, obviously. So I'm going to give two examples of that, um, kind of slowly, just to walk through. And I, I do this more in, uh, I do this kind of for each class of drugs to some degree. But uh, we all know about the opiate um, problem now. These uh, narcotics uh, originally came from, um, poppy fields, and they've been appreciated for a long time. Um, in uh, early 19th century, the um, active ingredient of the poppy plant, which uh, was named morphine, is, um, was made. In, and heroin is um, just an acetylated version of morphine, so they're really one and the same. Um, it's just that it gets there a little quicker. And it wasn't that big of a problem until we got the um, syringe and hollow needle, and then we could deliver this really um, wonderful feeling drug easily. But one of the, um, and we have many versions of these drugs now, so all narcotics are opiate agonists. They all activate receptors in the brain that um, recognize their shared structure and produce effects. So a narcotic is any drug that activates an opiate receptor. But the question, I guess, 
many of us would have is why do we have opiate receptors for these poppy plants growing you know, somewhere else just in case? So we obviously have those because we have our own endogenous opiates, and those are opioids, and there's many of them. So just as there's many of um, uh, narcotic or opiate synthetic or plant-derived opiate compounds, there are probably at least as many. There are dozens of these and dozens of these. I'm just giving sort of the top list. But these are all chemicals that our brain produces that activate those opioid receptors. And that's what those opioid receptors are doing there. They're there not to respond to the drugs on the left, but to respond to the drugs on the right, or the, the um, neurotransmitters on the right. So these compounds, and the plant itself, you know, the, the plant evolved this ability because one of the main effects of opioids is to make you fall asleep. That's why the god of dreams. And if animals would eat the plant, and fall asleep, then they would avoid the plant. So it was really the uh, uh, evolutionary strategy on the part of these plants to not to survive, but we like that effect. So anyway, we all these drugs are mimicking that. So why do we have these opioids? Not so much are they playing a role in sleep, but they play a big role in what's called stress-induced analgesia or um, stress-induced pain blockade. And you may have experienced this. I had this, um, well, let me just give you a list of the things that many of, there's more than this, but exercise can release opioids to help us cope with the pain. Being in too much cold, speaking of Chicago, uh, can help us. Fear or the, or the uh, likelihood of something fearful happening in the future can release opioids. Sex, social defeat, um, acupuncture, electric shock, food deprivation, force swim, heat, immobilization, novelty. One of my favorites is, because um, I teach undergraduates, unsolvable anagrams. So if you, because I work with these, uh, I shouldn't say neurotic kids, but they're all, you know, really want to do well all the time. So if, if you give, um, we can test the release of opioids in this way. Um, we measure pain sensitivity. I haven't done this experiment myself, but it's been done many times. In uh, students who arrive for class, we measure their pain sensitivity. And the way that's usually done for um, in a, in an experiment like this is you put your hand in cold water, like ice cold water, and you keep it there as long as you can. So we get for each student, how long can you keep your hand in the cold water? And then we say we've got a special extra credit test, they like that. So they're all on high alert because they want to get extra credit, and these are unsolvable anagrams. But before we let them do the test, we give half of them an injection of saline and the other half an injection of Narcan or naltrexone. So they get 15 minutes to try to work on this test, which is just impossible. There's no way to solve it. They can't get the extra points, which is enough to cause stress-induced analgesia in those that got the saline pretreatment. But those that got the Narcan ahead of time block all their opiate receptors, and so they are um, still pulling their hand out at the same speed. Does that make sense? And we can do that with all these, uh, all these kinds of experiences. So the reason that we have uh, endogenous opioids is to help us deal with stress or danger or um, concern because we're better able to survive our challenges in the environment if we're not focused on how we don't feel good, how we're worried about something. Doesn't that make sense? So most people know that opioids are part of an adaptive response to environmental challenges that help us cope with injuries or dangers or stressors so that we can be more likely to survive. But many people don't realize that uh, we've been evolving a long time. We also have anti-opioids. Again, dozens of compounds. And these are also an adaptive response. And they, what they do is the exact opposite of the endorphins and the enkephalins and the dynorphins, all those chemicals I gave you before. They increase pain sensitivity. 
they um, are released when you feel safe and when you get free from the danger or the challenge. And this makes sense because pain is critical for survival. So if you, um, let's say you come home from work this afternoon or leave the talk and, um, I don't know, dog comes out and, and chases you and bites you, it would be not very good if you were to you know, go under the curb and sit and talk about your gap in your leg or something and, oh, this is really bothering me. And meanwhile, the dog is snarling. So in, within a few seconds, you'd release endorphins or similar compounds, and you'd block the pain so that you'd be able to fight or flee from the dog better. But if you then don't feel any pain and you go about your day and you've got this um, maybe rabid dog uh, bite, then you're going to not be very good shape either. Your chances of survival aren't so great. So you might um, get an infection, or you might even forget about this dog and walk in the same place tomorrow and the next day and the next day and keep getting bitten. So pain is you know, really important to tell us what not to do and also to help us to not redo the things we just, um, you know, to learn that, to stay away and to take care of ourselves. It's so important, in fact, that as soon as we're safe, we release anti-opiates. One of my favorite examples of that is from a student who um, was playing in the finals of some you know, very important soccer match, and uh, might have been the state championship or something, and he broke his tibia, he didn't know this, in the, in the last like four or five minutes, and he kept playing, played the game, the rest of the game, he celebrated, they won, everything was great, didn't feel any pain at all until he got in the minivan with his parents. And then he was safe, and all of a sudden he was overcome. He said, oh my gosh, I think something happened. He looked down, and his leg was not in good shape. So it, we have to both be able to block pain and to feel it. So that's great, except because our body can do this, and because homeostasis is so critical, a baseline feeling state is so critical, for opiate addicts, these compounds are really upregulated in response to regular use. So there's um, the earliest study I can find, although there may be earlier ones, is from 1980, where this guy, uh, Han, and his colleagues took brain extract, which I, uh, from, you know, he probably crunched up the stuff in the brain, and then, um, and these were rats that were tolerant to opiates. And you know, when you're tolerant to opiates, it's really interesting. You can take about 200 times what would be a lethal dose in a naive person and barely feel anything. You just don't feel miserable. But you, you get that little tiny bump, but nothing really worthwhile. So how does that happen? Well, he took brain extract from morphine-tolerant rats, and it gave, uh, he gave it to... Um, other opiate-dependent rats, and they um, immediately uh, were tolerant, so that the morphine stopped working. Actually, it wasn't, they weren't opiate-dependent rats. These were naive rats that he gave it to. And so he gave them morphine, and he gave them this brain extract, and they were tolerant. It, it, the morphine didn't reduce pain sensitivity, for instance. And another guy, a few years later, took cerebral spinal fluid, getting a little more sophisticated, from morphine-dependent rats, after about six hours of abstinence, and he gave that this time to morphine depend rats who were also addicted, and they immediately went into withdrawal. So the CSF, or the cerebral spinal fluid, acted just like Narcan from one rat to the other. Um, one of my favorite sets of studies comes from Eric Wardelak, who um, is kind of a complicated. Uh, scenario. So let me describe it to you. He, um, he was inducing conditioned fear in rats. So the rats would come into a room and they would get an electric shock. And they could predict that they were going to get that electric shock when a light came on. As a result of learning that the shock was coming, they released opioids. I told you that stress-induced analgesia comes from conditioned fear. So they had a conditioned fear they released opioids, 
And um, they were not sensitive to pain at all. But he also then gave them a safety signal. So when the shock was going to go off, and it wasn't a lot of shock, and it wasn't physically damaging, but it was psychologically stressful. Um, when the shock was going to go off, another light came on. And as soon as that light came on, they were immediately sensitive again to pain. And the way he measured this pain sensitivity is just how quickly do they withdraw from a hot lamp. So it's kind of, uh, it, it was a, like a reflex. It wasn't something that hurt them, hurt them. Um, but what was amazing is, instead of giving them electric shock one day, he, brings, he brought them in and he gave them morphine. And then he put the safety signal, the light on that induced safety, and they were, the morphine effects were abolished right away. They went away in a few seconds. And he concluded that the, as a result of knowing that they were now safe, they released their anti-opioids, which were a B process that were conditioned to this whole scenario. And since these early studies, we have dozens of compounds that are anti-opiate. So just like there are dozens of opioids, there are dozens of anti-opiates. Cholecystokinin, neurotensin, most of them are they're all peptides, actually. Um, Ephemerephemide, OFQ, there's all of these um, do things like um, enhance the effects of, uh, they make morphine animal, they make morphine work less well, I'm sorry. Um, they induce dependence and withdrawal signs, and they're upregulated with chronic exposure to opiates. And that's part of the reason, probably, um, that the a process for opiates, which includes blocking pain, um, slowing breathing, and euphoria, and all these other symptoms, are exactly the opposite to the withdrawal sign. So opioids produce these effects, just like opiates do, the drugs we take recreationally or for in clinical reasons. And these withdrawal signs are all produced by anti-opiates. This isn't the only reason you're so, you know, opiate dependence happens, but it's part of the reason. And it definitely illustrates that the brain compensates. And it, it also illustrates this basic um, fact that whatever you take a drug to do regularly, if it's going to work on your brain, your brain produces the exact opposite effect. So here's the A process, there's the B process, and the net effect is basically normal, which is OK if you have the drug on board, but not so great if you don't. So I want to give another example, kind of a different sort of B process. Um, and this is about marijuana, obviously, also very popular. Um, I, I, I put this paper up because it has this huge meaning to me. I know some people remember where they were when the Twin Towers were attacked or, I don't know, the space shuttle blew up or something. I remember exactly where I was in grad school when the um, cannabinoid receptors were identified in the brain. So this is, it was big news for me. I, 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 uh, I really, I think I said that I really loved smoking pot, and um, I was clean, but I was still very interested in its effects. And we were, we knew, we being scientists studying addiction, realized that there would be receptors in the brain for THC, just like there were receptors in the brain for heroin or morphine, um, but we, we didn't know what they were. They hadn't been identified yet. So this was 1991 when um, somebody discovered the receptors. And there was uh, a couple of huge surprises about this. So the first thing we saw in this paper that I just described was um, a figure like this, which is a, a sagittal slice, like a mid-sagittal slice, right to the middle of my face, of a rat brain, um, stained black where there are the receptors for THC. And those are called CB1 receptors. We now have two versions of cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. The CB1 receptors are 
the ones responsible for THC's effects, and they're most prevalent in the brain, um, CB2 or more in the periphery. But really, this what was so surprising about this is they were so abundant. In fact, most of us, except that it was published in the great journal, thought that there must be a mistake. If we look at the receptors for opiates, which had been done for about 20 years at this time, or for the places that cocaine acts, or methamphetamine, or nicotine, we would see nowhere near this abundance. It, it looked like they just screwed up their assay and they had way too much staining. It turns out, though, that this is the most abundant receptor in the brain. Um, and it's a particular kind of receptor, which is the most abundant kind of receptor. But this is a ton of protein. This is almost in every single synapse. Almost. So you, even though you may not look at rat brains too often, you can probably realize this is all the cortex, which is basically black all around. Um, this is the striatum. So the cortex is everything we're conscious of. Any, any conscious experience is processed in the cortex. Below that is the striatum, and that, whoops, is um, to do with movement and motivated behaviors. Then um, the hippocampus up here, which is also black, black, it's one of the most densely stained places, is, um, whoops, I don't want to do that. Let's try and do something else, is uh, responsible for lots of interesting things, but for forming new memories, also for imagination, also has a lot to do with depression and processing sort of a context, so loaded. Um, another area that's worth noting is maybe down here. This is the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is, um, whoops, I keep doing that. I'm sorry, I'm not very good with this. The hypothalamus is um, critical for sort of coordinating the body's response to the brain's uh, interpretation of what's going on. So things like um, motivated behaviors, like eating and sex and drinking and uh, things you feel strongly about that are going to help you to do or go toward or away from something. And then quite a bit also in the cerebellum at the back of the brain. But basically, the, all the other drugs and their interaction sites wouldn't be 10% of this. It was just shocking. And it begged the question, of course, why do we have all these receptor sites? We now know where THC is acting, which is everywhere, pretty much. Um, but why is that? So it should be for something like the same reason that morphine works because it um, mimics endorphins. THC works because it mimics the endocannabinoids, which took a few years. We usually, dis we almost always discover the receptor first, and then the um, chemicals, the natural chemicals or the neurotransmitters that interact with that receptor. So there turns out to be two of those neurochemicals, um, anandamide and 2-AG, and they, uh, anandamide is a, is a Sanskrit word for bliss. So I think the researchers uh, you know, were thinking that this is a, a chemical like THC, and they thought THC produced bliss, which I happen to agree with. Um, not everybody feels that way. But uh, anyway, so they're, they're very lipophilic. They're different than other kinds of, they're different than the opioids, which were strings of amino acids. Uh, these were kind of a novel sort of chemical. So not only is the receptor all over, and we have these kind of unusual neurotransmitters, but a, a third surprise might be that they, the way they act, and this is just to show you, it's from a kind of a recent review. We've spent, so those chemicals were discovered also in the 90s, late 90s, and we spent the last 20 years trying to understand what they do. And this is a pretty current model of what they do. It looks like it might be foggy for you. And it, it, uh, it doesn't matter that it's foggy, because I'll try to translate this for myself. The, the really weird thing about these chemicals, and you may remember this from somewhere, but normally um, there's a presynaptic neuron, uh, nerve cell, that has uh, an axon terminal, so that it sort of ends in this little foot 
that releases neurotransmitter that then travels across the synaptic gap to the postsynaptic cell. And in the postsynaptic cell, uh, it would cause some signal that would then go to another uh, axon terminal in another cell. So there's about 100 billion or 86 billion neurons, and they communicate this way. There's some activity in this presynaptic cell that causes the release of neurotransmitters to go across this gap, activate the postsynaptic cell, and so on. So weirdly, the endocannabinoids are travel in the opposite direction. They go from the postsynaptic cell up into the presynaptic cell. So this is called retro, whoops, I'm going to show you my puppy in a second, but that's called retrograde signaling. I know, that's probably a better, it was, it was a present for looking at this slide. <laughs> so retrograde signaling, um, you know, it's a novel way of communicating. We hadn't known much about this. Um, and so different from the way dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine or um, acetylcholine, any of those chemicals work. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but what, what is it? What's going on with that? So to try to describe that, what does it mean? I have a picture of my dog. Um, this is Bowden, and uh, he's now two, and he's about 120 pounds, but he was so cute like this. So what um, the endocannabinoids do, and the what, reason they're in almost every synapse is because when the postsynaptic cell gets a message in a traditional neurotransmitter, usually glutamate or GABA transmission, um, sometimes that glutamate or GABA transmission signals to the postsynaptic cell something um, important happened that we kind of need to pay attention to. And so it quickly, within a few seconds, synthesizes and releases the endocannabinoid to go back to the presynaptic cell to change the kind of circuit that's happening in the synapse. <clears throat> I don't want to cough because of this thing, but <clears throat> I think a good cough would help me. <clears throat> um, I have a thing up here, but I don't think I need it. OK, so um, what that means is that it acts kind of like a neurological highlighter that something important just was conveyed across the synapse. And that's why it has to be in every synapse, because you never know which synapse is going to send an important signal. Something important just happened that we need to somehow mark. So this is going to play a critical role in neuroplasticity, or learning, or adaptation. And that's probably, in part, why it's so dense in the hippocampus and in the cortex. Um, and really, what it's going to do is help us sort important information from non-important information. So here's the story about Bowden. He was um, about this old, really, this is right around the same time, and my daughter was outside for some reason and dropped a piece of her breakfast, which happened to be a piece of bacon, in the grass. And Bowden, of course, you know, he'd never seen anything like that bacon. I mean, he was unglued kind of for a while afterward. But what I think happened is, here's little Bowden's head depicting, and that's actually a piece of DNA, but we'll pretend it's bacon. Um, he finds the bacon, and his little brain gets very excited. So in the olfactory lobe where he's going to smell that, and in the um, movement places, and maybe in the memory, he's gone back to that spot in the grass for years. Um, so all in the critical pathways that were active when he found the bacon, he wanted to mark that. This is highly meaningful. And the same thing would happen to us if we found our equivalent of bacon, maybe you know, a potential lover or a great idea or, um, I don't know, really good talk, something. Uh, so we would activate the pathways that are, that are awake during that event so that we can kind of um, remember and solidify that, to say, this is important. This has meaning. It doesn't have to be just good, by the way. It's just important, salient, something to pay attention to. So that's how the endocannabinoids work, and that's why they're in all these synapses. Because you never know. It, are you going to be, you know, the reason we have so many cells is because we have a lot to process. 
And we're basically in the business of sorting what's relevant or important or critical from what's not. And endocannabinoids help us do that by signaling when something critical happens across a synapse. And they do it really quickly. So that's good. But here's our brain uh, with a bong or with some really potent weed. When I was using it, it was maybe 10% uh, or usually lower 5% THC. Now it's sometimes 25%. So just imagine smoking that. And now all those receptors are occupied. What does that mean? That means everything is salient, right? This is amazing, truly. The food, oh my gosh, right? I remember one time coming home late and at my same friend's house, or anyway, uh, and we had rice aroni. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so good. How do they keep this on the shelves? You know, I, I wouldn't eat rice aroni, but you know, or the music, or the texture of the chairs, you know, whatever it is, everything is so highly wonderful and interesting and salient and relevant. And that's what's fun, right? Isn't that great? This is what's important, everything. Oh my gosh. The poems do it right, right? Um, so uh, I call this flooding the fields because I think it's important to go back to what uh, the endocannabinoids are doing and contrast that with what THC is doing because basically of the concentration differences. So there's this great, uh, I think a Japanese cone or something, but what, what use is a watering can if the fields are flooded. So if, you're, if everything is salient, nothing is important. Isn't that true? That's one problem. And this is OK, because so what you can't remember later. One of the reasons it's in the hippocampus, anandamide and 2-AG are in the hippocampus, is because they help us tell what to store in long-term memory. Well, if you're supposed to store everything, nothing gets stored. So that's OK. So you have a little amnesia. It was a lot of fun. Um, and and the, so we, this is what the acute effects are, enhancing stimulus saliency or meaning for all kinds of stimuli, um, stimulating pleasure and relaxation. You block memory a little bit because you can't sort what's important from what's not. You have critical tracking errors because you're supposed to, with critical tracking, you're supposed to sort important from extraneous information, and you can't do that very well. Um, and I wanted to just uh, actually go back a second. I think uh, those things aren't so bad, because it's so much fun. No big deal. Um, and I wanted to just insert here a little talk about the medical marijuana. And this is going to be really brief, and it's my synopsis of the current literature, um, which is not really the topic of the discussion today. but. Um, cannabidiol is one of the compounds in marijuana plants. So marijuana has lots of compounds. Two, two active ones are THC and cannabidiol. And interestingly, the cannabidiol blocks the effects of THC. So it's an antagonist for THC psychoactive effects. The higher the THC content, the more of the um, enhancing stimulus saliency you have. But the higher the cannabidiol uh, concentration, the less THC effects you have. Of course, the breeders know this. And if you're breeding for recreational purposes, you're going to breed in the THC and out the cannabidiol, because who wants the antagonist around? Um, but in fact, there, there's the most um, evidence for medical benefit for cannabidiol. It's, it seems to be a godsend for a certain um, set of childhood onset epilepsies that were pharmacoresistant, so they didn't respond to any of the traditional anti-epileptic medicine. Um, and you know, having seizures is really damaging for your life and for your brain. And so this is great. It, the, the evidence is very strong that these are helpful. I personally think cannabidiol should be over the counter because it's not psychoactive and it's not dangerous at all. As far as we can see, we have no evidence that it's dangerous, and it wouldn't be abused at all. Um, but the results for THC are very mixed, very preliminary. So one, the two main things you hear about are anxiety, 
disorders and um, pain for THC. For the anxiety disorders, there's a lot of studies, and it's uh, very noisy data. So one of the problems is, again, they're often looking at marijuana, not at THC effects. And the marijuana has cannabidiol, so it's not clear if it's the cannabidiol, the THC, or any of the other compounds that are having an influence on anxiety. But overall, I would say um, some, about half the studies show increases in anxiety and have so uh, reductions in anxiety. I think there's definitely a dose relationship here. So low doses may be anxiolytic or reducing anxiety, maybe, of THC. And high doses are probably anxiogenic or creating anxiety. That also depends on um, genetic background, so for different people, different kinds of things. But the data are not strong. And moreover, you really get tolerant to this effect. So if you were anxious and you had never smoked pot before and you happen to have a little bit of THC and be of a favorable genotype, you might reduce your anxiety. But for people who regularly smoke, this effect goes away and it's actually more anxiety producing. The, you also get tolerance to the antinociceptive or analgesic effects of THC. So a lot of people are talking about, and it's all over the web and my dog walking friends are all like, oh yeah, this is great. Um, but the data are not out there. And in fact, um, I guess you probably have heard this, but about 60% of people respond favorably to block pain with placebos. So I don't, if we do the controlled studies with THC, it's not really clear. Um, they seem to reduce pain in maybe naive users or infrequent users, but with chronic users, um, that effect is definitely gets tolerant. So I think that the evidence, we need more studies for sure. I'm all for the studies. I also agree that we don't have any good treatments for pain or anxiety, and both of those are kind of epidemic. So it's important to do the research. But I also think it's important to wait on the data. And I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, but I think we have a long history of going, yay, we found the perfect drug for this. And it never, it doesn't turn out to be the perfect drug. So we haven't been able to make a dent in either the pain or the uh, anxiety epidemic. So I just say, um, you know, we don't have the evidence. There's a lot of enthusiasm, but not a lot of data. I'll show you these. These are. There are many studies about this. With marijuana, it's really simple. So this is the binding of THC to those receptor sites, those black sites. Here is um, binding of THC to the receptor sites. This is in two different brain regions, in animals that never had THC before and in animals that had it. In animals that never had it in a di different brain region and animals that had it. And what they had in this particular study was four days of THC in increasing doses. So they got a pretty whopping dose at the end, but only four days. And basically, you see that the binding sites or the cannabinoid receptors are you know, half as much or less. Whoops, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. There's also in this other study, and here they did um, six days of treatment, maybe a little bit lower doses. So they started with uh, a very low dose, and they went to a medium dose, and then a little bit higher dose, but not this high. And you can see this is in a vehicle-treated or naive um, rat brain. This is a slice like this now. Um, all the black spots we talked about before, the cannabinoid receptors, and those are gone, largely. So really down-regulated in chronic users. Here's another one. There's many, many of these studies. It's a very well-documented finding, and it is a bummer because this, here's the control animal with the black spots. This is one injection, a high, a high dose of an, a THC analog. So this is a synthetic uh, cannabinoid, and one dose. And, they're, and they're, you can see easily much less dark spots. And here is... Um, I think this was eight days of, oh no, 14 days of a, of a very low dose, a medium dose, or a little bit higher dose, one a day for 14 days. 
and the receptors are gone. So this is a really simple form of downregulation. The brain's being overstimulated by THC. These, it, it can't sort what's important and not important, and it can respond by inducing a compensatory or an opposing response. And in this case, it is just to get rid of the receptors. So no big deal, I guess, except what is it like, and I can attest to this, um, to have a brain like the one on the right? What it's like is nothing is really interesting or salient or meaningful. And I, I mean, I don't mean to overstate it, but I chain smoke marijuana, and I, uh, if I didn't have it, talk about bleak. It was like being on the moon, you know, with no anything. And when I did have it, I wasn't really having the great time I had at the beginning. And I've heard from hundreds of people the same thing. They, a brain like that one on the right smokes or takes marijuana just to feel like there, it's worth living. But you don't have the machinery to detect value. I mean, to be blunt. It does. It does go back to normal. So I'm going to get to that. So it also happens in humans. There's a couple of studies. Um, that are done, and these are harder to do because we had to have the scans to do them. So in this one, they used a PET scan in 30 smokers and um, about the same number of controls. All those yellow areas are where the receptors are downregulated, so basically the whole brain. Um, and this downregulation does um, come back. So, um, But one important point I want to make is that there was a positive correlation. The longer you smoked, the lower your numbers of receptors. But fortunately, they do come back. And in this study, they followed them for only four weeks and four weeks of abstinence. And they were not fully back, but largely back. Probably takes a few months. I remember, um, so I went to treatment in Minnesota, and then I went to a halfway house, which was awful. And then but I was walking down the street one day in Minneapolis and uh, completely overcome with the color of the foliage. I had no idea. I hadn't seen in years. Red, yellow, green. I, I stopped you know, in the street thinking, why are people just walking by like nothing's happening? I think I, I just hadn't seen anything really interesting. Um, or beautiful like that. And so it, it does dampen the ability. So to summarize all this, many groups have shown that there's decreased cannabinoid receptor binding following chronic treatment with THC or other agonists. And this is probably why we have dependence. And dependence is withdrawal, because when you take it away, those receptors are gone, so you can't signal meaning, and also tolerance high tolerance. New recent studies are showing pretty clearly that this is even more dramatic in females than in males. And in all those studies that I just showed you, unfortunately, they're all done only in males. So if anything, it looks to be uh, exaggerated in female brains. And what is the effect of this? So you, for me, I, as I said, life was uninspiring, but I think we see uh, from the clinical literature lots of evidence in heavy smoking teens. So their cortical structure is altered, and that's because this is, again, using it as a teenager, which is what most people start. The, the cannabinoids are on board as the brain uh, is connecting up and wiring up and saying what's important. So when you're a teenager, you're figuring out what you value, like in terms of um, your identity and your career aspirations and your social life and your, um, your sexuality. All kinds of important decisions are being made. And as this is bathing the brain, that's going to alter the, those important decisions are going to be made in different ways. So plenty of evidence you alter the structure. You also downregulate this mesolimbic pathway I briefly mentioned earlier that has to do with pleasure. Um, I, I think that may be permanent. Um, and as a result of that, you have an increased risk for other addictions, 
heroin and alcohol, for instance. If you've had uh, marijuana as a teenager, you're more likely to have problems later on. And I remember when I first heard these data, I thought, oh, that's so dumb. You know, correlation doesn't mean causation. People who were likely to smoke marijuana are also likely to smoke cigarettes or drink or try heroin. But it turns out in the, in the research, in the basic research in animal studies, what we find is that an adolescent rat or mouse exposed to THC down-regulates that pleasure pathway permanently because the structures are being organized so that later on when it tries a drug, it doesn't get quite as much from it. The alcohol is good, but not that good, so I need a little more. It turns out animals and people that use more are less sensitive to the pleasure. So they have to step on the pedal harder to try to get the real result. And I think um, that is a real risk because what I'm saying is that the ability to appreciate important stimuli or valuable or pleasurable stimuli may be permanently uh, dampened. Maybe this is partly why they're more likely to uh, commit suicide to be impulsive, less likely to graduate high school, more likely to feel like in a bad mood. Um, and I won't go into the epigenetics, but maybe this uh, translates through generations. This is my second to last slide. So you tell me, chronic caffeine, what's the result of that? Lethargy, right? Chronic alcohol, anxiety and insomnia. Benzodiazepines, like Xanax, can't sleep, anxious, ecstasy, depression. So whatever you take the brain to, uh, whatever you take a drug to do, um, the brain produces the opposite effect. And that is my conclusion. And that is a bummer. <laughs> okay.